So the um, yeah, I am I am studying with uh, uh, attention. Uh, what she did said not said. Also studying attention and say some married studying with both of them. So it's, it's been a, a thirty year relationship I've had with the two of them. So it's wonderful to maintain that relationship over a long period of time. Like it's hard for me. It, I still thirty years sounds like a long time to me to my ears after all this time it's like wow has it really been it seems like you know time is time has flown by and I just retired from Kaiser Permanente after being working there for 37 years and so and before that I was at a different hospital for for 10 years so th these last four weeks have been the first time in 47 years that I haven't gotten up to go to work at a hospital so it's a <laughs> very different life for me and uh uh, so you guys are going to be my guinea pigs because I had to write a talk for next week um, for the beginner's mind. And so I thought I would try it out here. And uh, so looking for feedback, what, what works, what doesn't work. Because uh, I think that we are, you're, we're always beginning. Every single day we get up and we're, we're new. We're not who we were yesterday. So this we're in this, this, this constant eternal beginning uh, this, you know, state, if you will, um, or just beginning life new every morning uh, with, with each new dawn. So just to kind of give you what most attracted me in the beginning of, this, of my practice, it had kind of a weird beginning, I'll share that story, but um, I started out at Zen Center Los Angeles the last three years that Marizumi Roshi was alive uh, and you know, started working there. And my the first, actually it was the second, I took a, the usual uh, beginning Zazen class where they kind of do the introduction. The second class they had after that was led by both Tenshin and Seisen. So that's when I, that's, that, that was the beginning of that, that relationship. But the one thing that intrigued me and when I still kind of puzzle over it at times is the Buddha's awakening experience, his, his enlightenment experience. Because the first thing he says when he comes, you know, comes out of it, you know, the story is he sees the, the North Star and, you know, it says, all beings have the wisdom of the Tathagata. And that word all, you know, caught my attention. So, because naturally, you, you hear people say e everybody's welcome and everyone's included and everybody this and everybody that, and you know Kaiser too has this whole inclusiveness, um, you know type of practice, but there are always these exceptions <laughs> that come up when people talk about being inclusive. It usually means I'm including everybody that I agree with uh, rather than everybody. So you know the test for me over time with this practice is, is, is that all for real? Um, is, you know, did he really mean that? Um, and he didn't just say all humans, you know, or, you know, or he, he's including everything in that, all. And it's this absolute statement. And so, you know, the, one of the tenets of, of uh, Buddhism is great faith and great doubt and great tenacity. So, you know, that's been my question. Maybe speak a little more to the back of the oh, room sorry. so we can I've, all hear. I've been, I've been told that my voice is somewhat quiet, so I will try to project and enunciate. There's also a lot of room to move up. Oh yeah, please, come in closer. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> this, uh, this uh, has been, you know, my doubt, if you will, with, with this practice. Is it really all-inclusive? Where are there any gaps in that in inclusiveness? And, you know, so far, um, every time I think I found one, um, it turns out not to be true. So that's been, that's been my challenge for the practice. Is, uh, you said all, did you mean it? <laughs> uh, and I think that's true. I, I 
my, my faith in this practice and my experience of this practice is that it is absolutely true, that it is all beings uh, do have the wisdom and virtue of the Tathagata, thus come one to, the one come to thusness. Everyone has this, this wisdom of being present here and now. Uh, where we get into trouble <laughs> is what we do with that awareness. You know, so we have this, this, this allness, if you will, this no exceptions, no separations, and no othering that is really the premise of that all inclusion. Uh, but, you know, and the uh, Buddha did give a, a caveat to that, but for our upside down and inverted thinking, you may not realize it, or you may not take care of it, you may not, you know, um, act, act in a way or do things in a way or make choices in a way that align with the reality of the oneness with everything because that oneness with everything is true. And even science is now more and more verifying that that is absolutely true. So by the time we leave today, and part of my reason for now wanting to be more in person is this exchange of subatomic, subatomic particles that goes on with people that are in the room. So by the time we get out of this room, we will all be each other. <laughs> in a very real sense. Uh, <clears throat> well, what do we do with this, this oneness, this realization, this capacity that we all have, that all beings have? Um, and certainly there are, there are different uh, ways that that gets expressed. Uh, and this all also applies to all of those expressions without exception. Without separation, and that's this is where the rubber hits the road. Those people, those experiences, those beliefs, with which we do not agree, and which do not and may not be inclusive in and of themselves, are they also? Do they also? Do those things also have the wisdom of the Tathagata? Um, and I think they do. I think that my faith tells me, my experience tells me, yeah, the Dharma, which is just reality expresses itself in a myriad of different ways every minute and uh, that myriad of different ways you know rises out of the de dependent conditions that just happen to be in that time in that that space and there is no other way that reality could be because that's what was there that's what was present all of those things that gave rise to what was happening were present at that time even when it comes to countries going to war you know there's something that happens there's some some you know, coalescence of realities and, and, and uh, needs and desires and wants that drive people to fight for what it is they, they want. Um, and that is, that is also an expression of reality. And since there hasn't, you know, I can't, I can't even doubt that because has there been a time in history when we, somebody hasn't been at war with somebody else, um, we, we tend to do this. It seems to be a natural thing for us to do. We don't like it. We want to be in this world where there is no war. Um, and certainly, I was raised, you know, with a you know, from a, a Christian background in which you're supposed to try to get to heaven, where everything is peaceful and calm and beautiful, and and uh, the the lambs are lying down with the lions, uh, and uh, they're not eating each other. So it's a whole different um, perspective coming to this, where the Buddha is including everything as it is rather than as we want it to be. That's the hard part, because we, we have this, someone asked me yesterday at, at Long, Long Beach, I have a, a med meditation group in Long Beach, he says, well, what about, what about goals? I thought that was a really good question. Um, is that, does that fly in the face of being present in the moment? I said, no, I mean, if you're gonna set a goal, in order to achieve that goal, you gotta start doing something right now uh, and the, that goal begins its its achievement. The path to achieving that goal starts in the present. It doesn't. You, if you're putting it off, then you're, you're not you're not doing the goal. So right here, right now, is where you set the goal, and you figure out what you get, what you've got to do to get to whatever that end result is. Now, where again, where we get into trouble is this expectation and attachment to how it is we want that goal to turn out, or how it is we want the situation to be, how how it is we want reality to be. Reality is, you know. Going, if you have, if you're attached to some expectation that it's going to be uh, something else than it is, then you will suffer. Um, 
that's the that's the inevitable part. So it's not only that we are all one, but it's getting getting our expectations of what that oneness is out of the way, because it's not it's probably not what we expect. You know, like this this goal of enlightenment. You know, that's if you set this goal and your and your your expectation is that as a result of enlightenment, I will levitate no less than two inches off the ground and be constantly wise and smart and you know people will flock to me and uh, peel my grapes <laughs> carry me around on one of those what are those those carts that people you know carry you around on uh, so that's obviously if you're attached to that outcome you, you will be gravely disappointed <laughs> that's probably not going to happen uh, and this is that's where that's the upside down thing that's where we create you know separations and uh, you know, and, and an othering. And an othering is the, the that that you know probably the greatest evil <laughs> of out, that's out there because that's just that that tiny little breath of difference is you know there's there's me, and then there are those people, and those people are always the problem that we that we have, uh, and in this in this oneness. Uh, and you and I'm so glad it's in your the morning chat that you do with the, the great the, the gate of sweet nectar, which uh, I'm not used to because we do it once a year. <laughs> Whereas you, you guys do it, is it every week you chat that? So you guys have got that down. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's a you know I'm, I'm tripping over the rhythm <laughs> every time you guys chant it when, I, when I've been down here to do it. So I'm not used to, it. but wonderful that I am the Buddhist and they are me. So that's just that that acknowledgement that uh, the Buddha is not one of those people, or that that other thing that I want to accomplish. I am the Buddha, and they me. Yeah. The responsibility of that that practice is right here, right now, in me, in you, in all of us together. And the Sangha is you know original original meaning of Sangha is forest. We all are stronger together than we are apart because you're being buffeted against the winds and, and you know, a, a grove of trees or a collection of trees is going to withstand that much better than a tree that's trying to stand alone or get blown over. So, and <clears throat> even if you're like me, I am the ultimate introvert. So every time I get an email from Chola saying, oh, come give us a Dharma talk, I'm like, oh my God, I go to so people. <laughs> 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 um, and then I then I get over it, <laughs> and I say, "Yep, this is this is this is the job <laughs> that one takes on uh, as a teacher." So I I figured out. So what do we do about this upside down thinking? This will come up every single time. You know, this is where we are. You know, somebody hits your car or hits you. It's always that that person did something to me. How do we stay in this? In this, in this oneness, and in this, this compassion that is required, putting yourself in that other person's place, you know, what, what dependent conditions gave rise to them causing me harm, um, and that's, that's that's tough. That's where practice happens, um, and there's no one answer to that. Um, and the but the the foundation of getting to that space. Uh, is in, in zazen, and I admit I'm biased. Love this practice, so there, there, it probably happens in, in many other ways as well. I'm not saying this is not to discount other practices and other meditations. Uh, I just, when I sat in the zendo at Zen Center Los Angeles in 1992, I realized I was home. I was like, oh, this is it. This is me. This is it. <laughs> and I never, never tried any other practice, so I don't know about these other practices. But I'm sure there are other practices that are equally. Uh, as valid and, and effective to do that. So um, you, if you have those other practices, more power to you. Keep doing that if that's working for you. Um, this is the practice I've, I've chosen and um, I, I choose to be stuck with it <laughs> um, and like it very much. Uh, the koan that I, that this, this whole discussion re reminded me of is, you know, when I'm talking about what do we do with this inverted mind this is case number 17 from the Book of Equanimity. This is um, uh, the, the, the 
commentaries written by Shishin Wick, who was in this lineage, if those of you have met him. Uh, where is he? Boulder, Colorado, I believe. Um, <clears throat> attention. Hogan asked Administrator Monk Shoes On if there's even a hair's breadth of difference, heaven and earth are clearly separated. How do you understand this? Shoes On replied, if there's even a hair's breadth of difference, heaven and earth are clearly separated. Hogan said, if that's so, how could you understand it? Shuzan answered, I am just this. How about you, Osho? Hogan remarked, if there is even a hair's breadth difference between heaven and earth, are clearly separated. At this, Shuzan bowed. Sometimes we have to say things <laughs> over and over until we get it. And there's, you know, trying to explain that doesn't work very well. Um, you really just have to do it and, and, and take that leap of faith that heaven and earth are not separate, that you and I are not separate, me and those people are not separate, and then you can you know, insert any name of person with whom you disagree, you and that, that person or that group or those beliefs are not separate. And that's hard. That's, that's the work, to really be able to take that in and be one with all, as the Buddha pronounced, with all, without exception, without separation. Uh, and that, that hair's breadth of difference it shows up, and, you know, and, and the breadth of a hair is <laughs> not a lot extremely tiny, even the tiniest of separations create the suffering that we all do. And so if you're in, in that, and you, it's easy to recognize, you know, it, it, and it will happen before you even are able to form words about it. Someone says something, you, you get triggered, your body just reacts before you even have control over it. Like, why, why do I hate that person right now? Because, <laughs> and there it is, you know, it's, it's already there. It's Pre-conscious, we get triggered by so many things, a lot of un unconscious bias. It takes work. It takes work. Um, and that's that's the, the call to action that Zazen uh, is. This is not this, you know, peaceful, calm practice that people think it is. Those of you in the room who sat for long periods of time or sat in the Sashin, which is a, you know, it means collected mind, a long period of, of meditation, know that What's going on on the cushion is World Wars one, two, three through five, <laughs> you know, because it's it's this battle, and the only person you're battling is, is yourself, and you're trying to to really do this practice, to really apply this all that Buddha pronounced uh, in your life, and it's a lot of work. It's hard. It's hard to do. So um, much gratitude and accolades to those people who do that work because it's not easy. Yet yeah, it looks peaceful. People say that to me all the time. Oh, you do Zen, so you must be really peaceful and calm. I'm like, no. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Certainly, I work at you know trying to remain present in the moment, and that tends to look peaceful and calm. Um, but you know, there's battle still rages. You know, it's it's ongoing uh, every single time. Um, and then you know, part of my former you know life. Um, I list, all I did was listen to people complain all day long. Um, not, a, not a therapist, so I, I, didn't, I wasn't required to really help them because I even send them to a therapist <laughs> for that help. <laughs> but um, listening, to, listening to, to them was, was often a challenge because they, and usually it's, you can tell immediately that it's all about othering. You know, somebody did something to me and I'm, I'm being harassed, I'm being discriminated add your, your list of, of complaints. And certainly those events happen. They're, they're real. You know, and people are stressed out by them. It's, it's, I'm not discounting those complaints because they are valid. But what they do with that, those events is that's the secret sauce. What's the story that gets attached to those events? And that's where, where the suffering is. So if you, if this, if, uh, if you're, you know, if it's always somebody else's fault 
for why it is you are feeling the way you are feeling, you will suffer from that. Now, this is not to discount trauma. Trauma, trauma is trauma. You have to take care of trauma. If someone has assaulted you or attacked you or you know, verbally attacked you, there is trauma associated with that. And that is, so this is not to say that trauma is not real. Um, it is, and you must take care of that, otherwise it will continue to affect you. But you can start to deconstruct the stories around that trauma, because the, tr the story around the trauma came after the fact, uh, and it's usually not the cause of the trauma, because uh, those stories get kind of made up as, as we're going along. Um, so you can you know, start to unwind that tendency to you know, attach victim, victim stories to trauma. Yeah, somebody somebody said something that was very hurtful or racist or you know or, or what it is, whatever it is, and yeah, that's that's something that you know is does not create oneness <laughs> or doesn't create you know unity with people, um, but it's there, it's real, and this is where we can go to get the training on how to better deal with things when people other things. So back to my my uh, ZCLA story. Um, say, uh, say some pro I don't know if Sason remembers this because apparently it, it became it didn't it didn't affect me um, as much as people thought it did because uh, I, I had to be reminded that it had actually happened in that in that very first um, beginning Zazen class that you know, all of you have gone through when you come to a Zen center uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, instructor for the day he had an assistant with him who I guess was shadowing him because he was going to teach the class. So part of the discussion, they went around the room and um, said, you know, why are you interested in Buddhism? That was the question. Um, I don't remember what my answer was, um, and I don't remember what everybody else's answer was except one, <laughs> because one of, the, one of the people in the group said, well, I'm attracted to Buddhism because Buddha was white. And my brain immediately dismissed him and said, okay, another idiot. I'm in LA. They're all over the place. So, <laughs> so it didn't. It didn't even affect me. You know, I completely, you know, you know, just categorized him, boxed him, boxed him away in, in other 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 prison, <laughs> and went on with the instruction and didn't let it affect me uh, in that way. But apparently, this I, somebody must have said something to somebody. I didn't say anything to anybody. But you know, I when I came back, no less than four or five people came. And said, I heard about your class. Are you okay? Is this, you know, we want to make sure that doesn't, that, that's not representative of what we are here. And I'm like, I'm like I, 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 what are you talking about? I didn't even remember <laughs> what it was. But um, so, but certainly, you know, the Zen Center took care of that. You know, when you're immediately present with something that happens like that, and this was in, this was in September of 1992, which was a few months after the LA riots. So things were quite, you know, escalated at that particular time, and certainly people were trying to you know, make sure that people were being taken care of. Uh, and t taking care of things in Zen is a little bit different than it is in other places. And, you know, most other most other systems, if you will, I'll speak to the Kaiser system. They just want the whole idea of, uh, the, of the way they take care of things is to mitigate liability. They don't want to be sued. So that was my job to make sure that Kaiser didn't get sued. <laughs> Um, and so they're not really taking care of the problem. They're just trying to make sure that you know it doesn't you know create un unnecessary millions of dollars being spent. Um, but Zen um, basically requires that you be present um, and accountable for what what happened um, in, in this, in, within the center with yourself and with the center and with the extended sangha of community. Um, and that's what what they did. They did immediately very present with that with that situation and made sure that it got taken care of. Um, I you know I don't the, the guy who said it disappeared from the Zen Center. I did he did show up like a couple years later. I don't know what happened with that was not privy to that discussion, but you know, something caused him not to be there <laughs> for a while. Um, and uh, and it was it was kind of interesting that when I saw him I certainly recognized him and remembered him, and he came uh, came up to me and greeted me. And so it was nice that there was there was no animosity between us, whatever 
whatever they did, and I don't know what it was, they took care of the problem. Um, and that's that's the that's what Zazen does is it makes you immediately present with what's going on. First of all, with yourself, because you're the only one sitting with yourself. And second of all, with your immediate surroundings. And if you're if you're present with it, and you're not separating yourself from it, you're then 100% accountable for it. Even if it what didn't affect you directly, you're you're accountable. And that's what happens in community. That's why sangha. That's why we meet together. That's why we build these communities. Uh, because everyone's accountable. Everyone is, is working at being present. And you, are we are we always that way? One hundred percent of the time? No, no. <laughs> but but we're doing the work. We're putting in the effort, putting in the time to actually do that work. So that's the. And and there's really, it's a it's a very it's a very simple concept, if you will. You, know, you sit down, focus on your breath, um, and let the thoughts just flow through without attachment. Sounds simple, right? but yeah, I can do that for about two seconds, <laughs> and then the mind is gone. <laughs> and so the, the real work is constantly bringing yourself back. To, to this moment, and that's that's the ongoing practice. And certainly, we start out with this foundation of doing zazen, but this is not where it stays. You're not just practicing zazen. You're not just practicing being present in the moment when you're sitting in this very painful position for hours on end. It it, it is it is intended to translate into the rest of your life. So we and the practice does that for you. It you start with sitting, then you do walking. And then you do work. That's your life. So, and it's intended to be applied in your everyday life, in everything that you do, every moment, every minute of every day. So, returning to this foundation is is um, I'll speak for myself. What I need to do <laughs> to recenter, to uninvert my mind, uh, and and connect with with the oneness again. Uh, so, I, I do need to remind myself that I on a daily basis, and me and my four cats, and the cats know they don't get fed until Zazen is over. Um, so they, they sit with me, um, and, and we all kind of you know, uninvert our minds together. So that's the, and that's the work. So <clears throat> then, then there's the, these four vows that we take. Try to accomplish those. Those are absolutely Impossible vows. That's the that's the Okay, thanks. He's on, he's on. So saving all sentient beings, you know. But if we're one we are. And I think science bears that out. If you if you save yourself, take a pill. You save all sentient beings because you are the all sentient beings. Um, and it also makes you keenly aware that there are people out there who need your help. Um, and within whatever capacity you have, you have the opportunity then to move that out to the world and be the compassion that everyone talks about. I mean, compassion is another thing that we get a little twisted. We think that compassion is, is about being nice. Um, it may not be. It, you, the, 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 the um, what's the term I want? Um, tough well, tough love is one of them. But, you know, knowing what to do in every situation, you know, expedited, you know, means that you have, you respond appropriately with what to be done. Sometimes it's appropriate for because of what someone has done for that the most compassionate place for that place that person to be might be in jail. Might be not in the workplace that in which they've acted out. They might not may not need to be directly in your house. You know, if there's something going on, some habitual behavior that is continue to cause continues to cause suffering, um, maybe the most compassionate thing is uh, that they're that the, that person or 
persons needs to be someplace else. Or maybe you yourself need to remove yourself from the situation. So it isn't always about, you know, turning the other cheek or being always nice, but responding appropriately with what needs to be done. What's the, what's the best thing for yourself and the community to, to respond in, to this, this particular situation? Every situation is different. Um, sometimes it takes just sitting and listening and figuring out where that other person is, where they're coming from, getting out of yourself and being over there with them and saying, really feeling it from their direct experience and point of view, um, and then saying, oh, okay, well, I can make some adjustments, I can make some compromises, um, or it's too much, I can't make those changes, I can't make those compromises, um, and then acting responsibly. Um, I, you know, I found that, you know, when people are heated and escalated, um, they really, most of the time, they just need someone to yell at. Them. So I, I volunteer to do that for my clients because I would rather have the managers come yell at me rather than their employees. So they often took me up on that invitation. Um, <laughs> so one of the one of my favorite conversations is it was a new manager at Kaiser who just taken over the optometry department, and um, he was just confused by how Kaiser works and how entitled he thought his employees were. What is this? Oh. So we had this, I just listened to him go on and on and on and on about this. And I find this, and, he goes, and his last question was, how do I deal with this? So I told him the story, it's a Zen story, about the, the, the king who was, he was all of the subjects in the, in the kingdom had, had gone crazy, they had gone mad because there was something in the water that was causing that. And um, he went to his, his trusted advisor and said, you know, how do, I, how do I rule a kingdom? You know, these people are completely crazy. Um, so his solution was, you drink the water. <laughs> so that's what this manager did, <laughs> was he just met them where they were in their craziness. And he came to me two years later and said, remember that advice you gave me? That was a Best thing you ever said to me. It, you, you miss, I said, I know I said, because the story is water. He said, I drank the Kool Aid. <laughs> and I said, good for you. And now he's, he's one of their best managers. So sometimes you have to, you know, that's, that's the part of the, the ego death that we talk about. Not that you really get rid of the ego, because you, you got to, your ego is a, a necessary part of you. So it's a, it has its good and bad aspects. So you, but how do you use it effectively? But sometimes you got to, Get past your own self, get past your own ego, and be over there where that other person is and in their experience to really understand. So he drank the Kool-Aid, got to know what the employees were like and how crazy Kaiser was runs things, and smooth sailing after that. Well, you know, probably not smooth, but <laughs> it was sailing rather than being stuck. Uh, so that was, that was a, a one, you know, one way of doing that. There are many other so <clears throat> that's that's my my origin story with Zen and what I recommend, even no matter how long you've been sitting, is to keep you know what's the it's a it's a twelve step saying keep coming back because you have to keep doing this. Uh, that's the tenacity part of this practice is to you know questions will come up. Um, There'll be a myriad of different possible answers to that. Um, and the one way or another way may work well in one situation, but trying to rubber stamp that solution doesn't always work. So you gotta come back again, sit with it again, come up with another way of, of approaching it, and then you do it over and over and over again, and it gets easier. You know, I was uh, I've told several people this thing, you know, life doesn't get easier, you just get better at it if you <laughs> if you live have the opportunity of you know living long enough. Now that I'm I'm officially old, um, <laughs> um, at least according to AARP, um, those life experiences are important, and you, you gain a lot of wisdom and knowledge from that. Um, but this sitting, this crazy practice, um, is what has grounded me for all of these years, um, and it's been 31 years this year that I've been doing it. 
So I'm, I'm like the Zen salesman, like, yeah, do this, it's great, it's the best thing ever. Um, but I realized there, there are many paths up the mountain. Um, this practice may not work for, for you, or you know, it may change along the way, you may try something else, and that's okay too. Um, is that it's you know in the oneness, um, there's nothing, nothing wrong. Uh, it's it's kind of trite that everything is perfect, just as it is. Uh, I think the word perfect is way too much. It's like everything is just as it is. Um, one of the writers I read before starting practice, Alan Watts, uh, in, in one of his books, he says, if you understand, things are just as they are. If you don't understand are just as they are <laughs> and that's what you've got to be in reality just as it is right. what say you what uh what is practice for you